This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Good evening and welcome to the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice. My name is Milburn Line and I'm the Executive Ju uh, Director here at the IPJ, which is part of the Kroc School of Peace Studies at the University of San Diego. We are truly delighted that there are so many of you uh, that have chosen to join us for what we are sure is going to be a stimul stimulating presentation by Professor Steven Spiegel, who will address the question, can Obama bring peace to the Middle East? certainly as pressing a challenge as ever following President Obama's uh, comment on Tuesday that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is, and I quote, a vital national security interest of the United States, end quote. We've invited Professor Spiegel to address this issue due to his deep experience working with all sides in this conflict. He very much embodies the scholar-practitioner model that we support at the IPJ and the Kroc School of Peace Studies. He's a noted scholar, a prolific author, but he does, he does not maintain an academic distance from, this, from the topic of peace in the Middle East. Instead, beginning in 1988, he launched a track two or informal unofficial dialogue process focusing on Middle East regional security. Since that time, his program has grown to be the largest dialogue program on the subject of Middle East security with participants from the highest levels of government and civil society attending from across the Middle East, in addition to North Africa, Europe, Australia, and the United States. He's experienced more than a few occasions where one of the parties or participants has stormed out of the room as the, as the conversations became heated. But more often than that, he has brought together people who often had preconceived notions of the others or of a, another particular group but has assisted patiently as these people begin to build trust and break down historic barriers. Professor Spiegel wholeheartedly embodies what President Abraham Lincoln would have said is, I destroy my enemies when I make them my friends. As I've discovered earlier this afternoon, Professor Spiegel is also amazingly humble, so he will not want me to mention or boast about the various American presidents who have consulted his expertise on this topic. And I will just say briefly that that includes five of the last U.S. presidents. Your program notes professional, Professor Spiegel received his Ph.D. from Harvard University, is on the faculty of UCLA's political science department, um, and has written over 100 books, articles, and papers, including one that is forthcoming on the U.S. approach to peace in the Middle East. Professor Spiegel serves as director of the Center for Middle East Programs at the Institute uh, at, the, at UCLA, and also provides assistance to Middle East programs at the Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation of the University of California. For his innovative work on promoting Middle East security cooperation, he received the CARP Prize in 1995, awarded to the UCLA professor considered to have done the most of any faculty member for the cause of world peace during the previous two years. Please join me in heartily welcoming Professor Stephen Spiegel. Thank you very much, Melbourne. Uh, my aim tonight is to talk about the prospects for a solution, and particularly for the prospects of our president bringing about a solution, which he deeply is trying to do. Uh, but I suggest that we uh, discard the score counting. I'm going to say some things that if you're sympathetic to Israel, you might not like, if, particularly if you have a particular persuasion. And I'm going to say some things that if you're sympathetic to the Palestinian Arab side, you might not like. Because my aim is not to score points for one side or the other, but to get to a resolution of this conflict. And I want to make it very clear. 
for the Palestinians. It is critical to their future to have a state of their own. They have struggled and they've made a lot of mistakes, God knows, over the last hundred years. But this is a great opportunity for them and this is a great president who could bring about their dream of a Palestinian state. And I know some Palestinians have bigger dreams and smaller dreams. But I'm talking about a uh, Palestinian state on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip as we know it, based on the 1967 lines, but not exactly that territory, as has been the centerpiece of American diplomacy since the Clinton administration. So this is a moment of opportunity for the Palestinians, and I hope they won't blow it. And I want to say something to the Israelis, and that is, I do not believe that the status quo is helpful to the future existence of the State of Israel. Certainly not at a time when the possible development of Iranian nuclear weapons could threaten Israel and threaten its existence. Now we can go on later in this discussion, uh, an extensive discussion about Iran and the weaknesses and strengths of Iran and what a nuclear force might represent. But certainly at this moment in Israel's history, it doesn't help to have a conflict with the United States. It does help to end the status quo, to move to a Palestinian state in the kind of arena which I defined just a moment ago. And it is in Israel's interest to do so, as we know from the polls and the latest polls out today, the overwhelming majority of Israelis want. The problem is that the Israelis have become disillusioned with the Palestinians. And you know, in an earlier period, in the last decade, when your restaurants and buses are being bombed, it doesn't help the peace process. And we also know, sadly, that Palestinians are disillusioned with Israelis because the promise of Oslo has not been fulfilled. So we've got two societies, both of which the Poles tell us want peace and both of which are disillusioned and both of which are making many mistakes. So I ask you to set aside the scorecarding and, and to figure out where my views are. No one in this conflict is objective and I don't pretend to be objective, but I do want to bring about a solution. So I'm going to try to tell it, what it is, where it is and tell it how I see it, and I'm going to criticize everybody involved because I don't have to make those decisions. <laughs> but I do have a particular set of um, uh, interests uh, uh, and attitudes and perspectives of my own, and that's what I will try to share with you tonight. Uh, and uh, then you can all attack me as you uh, uh, might like. Now, how do we get to this moment today? This moment of as the introduction suggested, headlines and speeches and intense discussions, some of which I've, you know, been on the sidelines for in the last few days. Everybody who's dealing with this area is on the phone. I've been on the phone a good part of the day talking, arguing, pr taking sides on the question of an Obama plan, and you'll hear where I stand, taking sides on where we go from here in the United States, because we are stalemated. Here is a president who came to office committed to doing something about this issue, and he hasn't succeeded at all so far. And you know from health care that this is a president who doesn't give up easily. He cogitates, he questions, he tries to come up with new answers, but he keeps at it. And when outsiders are convinced that they've defeated him, he comes back. And that's what you have to learn and that's what we're learning about this president. So how does he compare to the past? You know, where, how do we get to this point? Well, first of all, uh, if we go back after the 1967 war, uh, when American efforts began, particularly in the Nixon-Ford era, we were doing, especially after the October 1973 Ramadan-Yom Kippur War, uh, uh, 
We were doing shuttle diplomacy. Kissinger was doing shuttle diplomacy and getting disengagement agreements. Then Carter came in with the perspective that in a few short months, he was going to solve the entire comprehensive Arab-Israeli conflict. Well, that so frightened Anwar Sadat that he went to Jerusalem, as you recall, and Jimmy Carter at Camp David, the first Camp David in 1978, sat down with a yellow pad, you know, before computers, and wrote, wrote the draft of Egyptian-Israeli agreement. Now, some presidents can do that. Some presidents can do that. Carter. Clinton, Bush won, Obama. Some presidents can't, like I would say, Ford, uh, Reagan, Bush too. But he did that, uh, and he deserves a great deal of uh, credit uh, uh, for that. But he wasn't very effective in the whole comprehensive structure in which he had uh, uh, aimed. Ronald Reagan came, and although Reagan had an interesting plan at one point on some kind of Jordanian-Palestinian uh, confederation, he wasn't terribly interested and terribly successful. And therefore, in reaction, came George Bush the first. And George H.W. Bush was committed, and, his, uh, uh, and so was his Secretary of State, to getting the job done. But you know, uh, George uh, uh, George Bush, he had a particular animus to the very always controversial issue of settlements on the West Bank. And at a critical moment, the then Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir came calling in Washington, and you know when you have these summit meetings, there's always a time when the two leaders, uh, Israeli and, or any country, but Israeli and American, speak alone. Obama and Netanyahu do it for longer than most, actually, uh, despite the controversiality of their relationship. But Shamir came to speak to Bush, complete mismatch, one was tall, one was short. Uh, uh, what, they had completely different backgrounds. Shamir had been in the Stern Gang, and uh, 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 one of the terrorist groups in the, uh, uh, in the, in the late 1930s, early, in, 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 in the early 40s. Uh, they're very, totally different, but Bush, of course, was the elite American, and Bush, said to Shamir, you know, we've got a problem with settlements, and I want your assurances that uh, as we move forward in the peace process, the settlements are not going to be a problem. And Shamir said, Mr. President, no problem. Now, uh, and Bush said, very well then, thank you very much, and they walked out. Total misunderstanding, because what Bush thought he heard was, when it comes time, we'll get out of the settlement to where it's not going to be a problem in your moving forward, Mr. President, in resolving this conflict. And what Shamir meant was, Mr. President, it won't be a problem because I'm not going to move any settlements, I'm going to continue to expand, and it's not going to be a problem. <laughs> and as a result, we had the last major conflict between uh, Americans and Israelis. And you know, everybody's talking about the Israeli-American conflict. The media loves it because it's different. Uh, after the last 16 years of Clinton and Bush, it's different. Uh, and indeed, the Bush-Shamir conflict was so bad that both Clinton and Bush, Clinton because he wanted to be different than Bush, and Bush because he wanted to be different than the first Bush, uh, the, the two uh, shied away from that kind of approach. But before Clinton became president, U.S.-Israeli conflicts were the norm. It wasn't this sort of love affair that uh, the embrace, as I call it, that we've come to know over the last uh, 16 uh, years. The conflict uh, of Bush won. Carter had loads of conflicts with Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin, the first Likud, the, uh, the first right-wing pri prime minister in I Israel's history, Begin and Carter were just on, you know, they were on different tracks. Carter was, saw the Palestinians as the Middle East blacks. He hadn't done enough for the blacks, so he was going to do something for the Palestinians. Begin had no interest in the Palestinians. Uh, uh, quite the contrary. He's the prime minister who expanded the settlements in the first place. So uh, they, uh, they were always disagreeing. Uh, crisis in American-Israeli relations was the norm. And of course, uh, Nixon and, and, and Ford were kind of ambivalent. Uh, it went kind of a roller coaster relationship up and down. Uh, 
Nixon had a much better relationship with the Israelis than American Jews. Uh, Ford had been a big supporter of Israel, but didn't like Rabin, who was prime minister at the time. So uh, tension was frequent. In fact, in, in 1975, Ford got so angry at the Israeli negotiating posture, this was a labor government, that he announced that he was going to have a reassessment of U.S.-Israeli, uh, of the Middle East, by that which he meant, and everybody thought, and that was true, U.S.-Israeli relations. So you talk about U.S.-Israeli conflicts. Uh, this is the kind of conflict we used to be used to. But the big, you know, people completely forget the Eisenhower era in the 1950s. Eisenhower had questions of whether Israel had, should have been created. Eisenhower, uh, although he had liberated the concentration camps, uh, was a general. And in his mind, Israel was a real burden to the United States. He tried to keep Israel away. I've read documents uh, about his attempt to keep Israel in the distance. He didn't see the Israeli Prime Minister, who was Ben-Gurion, uh, uh, more dovish than the Prime Minister we have today. It was a different world, and Israel was far away. And in it, in, I mean, the, the policy failed, actually, because the result was that the Israelis um, had, you see why I'm using these words, because it's the French, had a love affair with the French, and uh, Soon, the Israelis and French and British were doing things like the Suez Crisis, which the United States didn't like, and we lost control. And Eisenhower's main aim of stopping the flow of Soviet influence in the Arab world failed. But my point is that conflicts in U.S.-Israeli relations are the norm. I was asked recently to write an article uh, on a website, which I couldn't do, but to compare Eisenhower and Obama. That's, that's nonsense. <laughs> it's nonsense. The two are so far away, the times are so far away, the attitude is so different that um, uh, it's a mistake to even go there. So, but why is everyone talking about a U.S.-Israeli conflict? They're talking about this because we forgot in 16 years what normal U.S.-Israeli relations are. And I, I predicted this, uh, I don't mind saying, uh, because I was right. Uh, but the point is, it couldn't go on, couldn't go on. But so why did we go into the 16-year honeymoon? Well, first of all, uh, Clinton uh, uh, wanted to be very different than uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush. Uh, obviously, most new presidents want to be different than predecessors in the campaign. He criticized. Uh, uh, Bush for his uh, uh, refusal to provide loan guarantees to the Israelis when um, uh, he was providing uh, uh, a lot, when the United States provide, had, had been providing loan guarantees to Saddam Hussein. Uh, I actually had an opportunity to point that out to him in the, camp, in the campaign when I worked with him uh, on his uh, Middle East uh, posture. And Clinton had a very simple idea. Let the Israelis and Palestinians and the Israeli Arabs do it alone. Let them do it. Because remember, is the economy stupid? We've got to worry about the American economy. And so uh, the Israelis and Palestinians actually did do that in the Oslo Accords. That tweaked Clinton's interest. And he became progressively involved. But don't forget, this is the Israel of Rabin in this period. Yitzhak Rabin, with whom Clinton developed such a close uh, relationship uh, until his tragic assassination. Uh, and you remember Clint Clinton's comment, Shalom Khaver, when he left the White House that terrible Saturday afternoon uh, to recognize the death of Yitzhak uh, Rabin. He didn't get along so well with uh, Bibi Netanyahu in his first administration as prime minister. But Clinton progressively became involved in the peace process. But the mantra of the time was don't have problems with Israel, because George Bush had problems with Israel. So the mantra of the time was let's try to be uh, coordinating with the Israelis so that we don't have a conflict like George Bush had. Now, the Clinton people went far in pursuing that policy, but they didn't achieve success. 
And because Clinton got involved so late uh, in the administration uh, personally, because the administration uh, thought that the Oslo process would succeed uh, and it didn't, because they thought they were close to an Israeli-Syrian deal and they weren't, uh, the Israeli-American relationship survived, but American diplomacy failed. So the new administration, the George Bush, the second George Bush, George w, W's administration came in, and they drew the conclusion that diplomacy doesn't work. They couldn't do diplomacy, as we saw through the eight years. But they assumed uh, that somehow the, it would just go away. There were moments when the Bush administration tried to do something, the roadmap, the Annapolis conference, there were moments, but they couldn't figure out how to way to do the job. And in Washington, and among the think tanks, and among the specialists, and among those out of power, power the conclusion was drawn, Clinton's way didn't work because you can't coordinate with one side, and Bush's way didn't work because you've got to do something. You can't just sit around and watch. You can't say, as Bush did in 2003, when he met with uh, Prime Minister Sharon and then Prime Minister uh, Abu Mazen, who's now president today, you can't say, I'm going back to Texas and I'm going to ride herd on you guys till you get this deal done, and then go back to Texas and forget about it. Can't do that. Terrible summer in 2003, and the process went um, backwards. So, the word in Washington, the word in Washington was at the turn of administrations, we've got to do something with both sides. Either we coordinate with both sides or we don't coordinate with both sides. We need an activist policy and we've got to get the job done. And so on his first full day in office, Barack Obama announced that he was appointing a Middle East envoy. George Mitchell, the revered former uh, Senator, Senate Majority Leader who had brought peace to Northern Ireland. And everyone applauded. And this president was the first president to get involved in the Mideast peace process on day one. Most presidents waited longer. Some, like Clinton, to their later regret. So Obama came in, and the idea percolating in Washington, I remember meetings going around in Washington, Free settlements. We're going to free settlements. Israeli settlements. The Palestinians will make a concession, and we'll have a process that's moving. And what happened? Uh, the insistence that settlements be frozen backfired. Now, why did it backfire? Well, first of all, uh, it uh, it didn't seize the imagination of the Israeli public. The Israeli public, which thought that Obama was an amateur. He wasn't ready for the big time. Who is this guy who has so little experience, he thinks he can walk in here and solve this problem? Who does he think he is? So not only uh, hawks, but doves in Israel weren't so excited about this. And people said, in Israel, why do we have to free settlements when even doves said, let's get a deal. Let's not bother with settlements, let's just get a deal if we're going to get a deal. And the Palestinians said, hey, if Obama wants frozen settlements, then we've got to toughen our stand. We've talked to the Israelis without frozen settlements, but now we need frozen settlements, free, a freeze on settlements. So it didn't work with both sides. But the real reason that the U.S. and Israel have had their problems in this period, let me be blunt, is personalities. I can envision an Obama presidency with Ehud Olmert or Sipi Livni, there wouldn't be serious problems. There would be issues because you have an activist president, wouldn't be serious. I can envision a President McCain, for some of you it's hard to say that, I'll admit, for me it's hard to say, but President McCain and um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, you don't have a lot of conflict. But you take Netanyahu and Obama, together with their different ideological perspectives, with their different experiences, with their different attitudes. Uh, it's like dealing with, uh, you know, uh, 
with the Republican majority because Netanyahu has been considered kind of Israeli Republican, and you know what the Republicans are like today. And so it's a mismatch. It's a real problem. And neither side, but I would argue, especially the Israeli side, has played this well. So, but you have to, and then Obama goes to Cairo, June of 2009. And he gives the speech that everybody expected to give on, everybody expected him to give on the Muslim world and American relations with the Muslim world. And, you know, it was a great speech, but it had one problem. When it talked about Israel, it talked about the Holocaust. It didn't talk about biblical ties. The Israelis were very resentful. It didn't seem to matter that Obama was speaking in an Islamic university in Cairo and talking about America's ties with Israel. He didn't get the credit that he deserved, in my opinion. But he made this historical interpretation that Israelis didn't like, and it made it tougher. But still, Netanyahu accepted the two-state solution, the first Likud prime minister to do so. And then Netanyahu accepted a partial freeze on settlements going further than any previous prime minister, especially any previous Likud prime minister. And it wasn't that long ago when uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were praising Netanyahu for having gone as far as he did. Indeed, last fall, while no one was paying much attention, the Israeli and American positions were much closer on negotiations than the Palestinian and American positions, or Palestinian and Israeli positions. Because the United States and Israel were saying, let's go to talks without preconditions. Forget about settlements, forget about other issues, let's start the talks. And the Palestinians were saying, no, we want more actions by Israel, we want more assurances, we don't want direct talks. And it wasn't long ago that George Mitchell was going to the European Union and saying you can't force Israel in Jerusalem, uh, in East Jerusalem, because no government can do that and survive. So while the rhetoric was a little different and the media was finding conflicts between uh, Washington and Jerusalem wherever it could, the truth of the matter is that the differences with the Palestinians were much greater. But still, the Israelis were suspicious. The administration was anxious to get uh, talks going, especially because you don't hire George Mitchell a negotiator if he can't negotiate. So you've got to have the negotiator negotiating. George Mitchell wants to negotiate, and everything's set. The president's supportive, the secretary of state's supportive, National Security Advisor Jones is supportive. Everybody wants to make this move, and it's still not moving. So finally, they agree on proximity talks, which is a step backward. Proximity talks are not like direct talks. Direct talks, you sit around a table, the Israelis are here, the Palestinians are there, the Americans are here, and you talk. It's not quite so simple, but that, that, that's good enough. Proximity talks, the Palestinians are in one hotel or on one floor, the Israelis are in another hotel or another floor, and the Americans shuttle back and forth, they're not actually talking to each other. But at least it was something. And at this moment, the administration decided the Israelis need some love. And that's exactly the way it was put in the White House. Because, um, you know, uh, Obama, he's a cool dude. He's a cool dude. And he doesn't, uh, you know, uh, he doesn't express love easily. You know, he's not like Bush or Clinton. He doesn't feel people's pain. He feels their problem. He, he assesses their problem. Big difference. But Joe Biden, Vice President, now he's Mr. Warmth. <laughs> Joe Biden is Mr. Warmth. He'll convince you he loves you. Uh, he's terrific at that sort of thing. He has a long 37-year history with Israel. He can talk about his close relationship with Israelis. He's the man in the administration to send to Israel to get things, to smooth things out, to get things moving. So, if you were trying to pick Mr. Good Guy from the Israeli point of view, Biden's your man. Biden is ready. 
Biden was ready. And as he told uh, uh, one meeting that he met with a few days beforehand as he was planning his trip, uh, and, and some of the people in the room were trying to get him to make proposals and push along the proximity talks, et cetera, et cetera. He said, the Israelis need my love. I'm going to spread love. So the administration saw this action of sending the vice president to, uh, uh, to Israel as an act of love. And Biden gets there, <laughs> and some committee, unbeknownst to the prime minister, no question in my mind, unbeknownst to the prime minister, announces some building in, in Ramat Shlomo, and everything spills out of control after that. Now, first of all, this is a Jewish area that I don't think a Palestinian who wants to negotiate and solve the problem expects to be in uh, on, the, uh, on the Arab side. But still, it's not the first time this has happened in the Obama era. It's insulting. It's appalling. It's inexcusable. And here, my criticism of the Netanyahu administration is quite deep. Because the thing to do would have been for the prime minister say, to say, I, I didn't know about this. I had strict, given strict instructions that I was supposed to know about these things, so I'm sending it back to committee for consideration. The committee could have sat on it for three, four months, and then without an announcement, quietly done it, and nobody would have cared. It was the announcement that was the problem, because the administration's fear that, it would, that the announcement itself suggested that it was not in control, that it did not have movement on the peace process. So uh, uh, the U.S. Israeli uh, confrontation spun out of control, spun out of control. But I would argue here that while the administration had been slow in recognizing, in a sense, how to handle the Israelis, the real fault here lies with the Israeli government. Uh, and uh, why did Clinton, a couple of days after Biden left, and Biden, remember, made this speech at Tel Aviv University, which was, you know, I love Israel. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I love Israel. Obama, too. <laughs> uh, I love Israel. We do. <laughs> and tell me what the problem is between us and you. But at any rate, uh, uh, it was a great speech, but nobody was paying attention. And Secretary Clinton had to call Netanyahu because he was saying, well, we didn't cave in to the Americans, we didn't do anything, and um, therefore, um, this problem, this crisis is over. He was taunting. It's not wise. Netanyahu is caught, and one can only sympathize with his position. His coalition doesn't want to do anything. At the same time, uh, the Americans are impatient to get something done. That was a problem he, he faced in the Clinton administration. That was a problem he faced in the Clinton administration. The Clinton people didn't know what to do with Netanyahu. They were unhappy with him, too. And he's in the exact same position now. A, a lot of people said, it's going to be different this time with Netanyahu. Even Shimon Peres, the revered president of Israel, sat Netanyahu down on you know, after he won the election, we didn't win the election, but after a coalition won the election, and said to him, you've got to think, are you going to be another Shamir who didn't do anything for the peace process or for American relations or for Israel's security generally? Or are you going to be Menachem Begin who gave back the Sinai, who improved Israel's position, who promoted that part of the peace process? Who are you going to be? Bibi, who are you going to be? And Bibi's got a very right-wing family and a very right-wing coalition. But a lot of people who are telling him also, you can be great if you just make some concessions. It's not so bad to make concessions. Uh, he hasn't functioned that way. And I want to ask Bibi Netanyahu tonight a question. What's more important? A few housing blocks in an area that's going to go to Israel anyway in a final piece and they're going to be built anyway. Is it worth making such an issue of these and similar uh, uh, matters at a time when Israel is confronting Iran? What's more important for Israel's security? If you're concerned and love Israel, what's more important? Netanyahu has thought that he could 
face down the American president. And um, that's a dangerous game to play. That's a dangerous game to play. He came to the American Israel Public Affairs APAC conference and got a rising ovation. And two days after Obama had won the health care victory, the two of them sat down late at night and Obama was all jazzed up about health care because of his health care victory and Netanyahu was all jazzed up because so many people were telling him in Congress and elsewhere, you know, stick to it, BB, you're doing the right thing and they had a terrible meeting. And lots of questions that Secretary Clinton asked the Prime Minister, they're not answered yet. The Israeli government was warned, don't do this, get it settled. Festering conflicts create new problems. So we have on this side a Netanyahu administration, a coalition of the right caught between the Americans and many other parts of the world and the coalition trying to balance back and doing a poor and poor job. Trying to balance both. Trying to, and on the other hand, we have the Palestinians. Well, for the Palestinians, it's great, you would think, if the Americans and Israelis are in conflict. You can sit on the side and just look good. And so if you're Palestinian, this is, at least on the surface, terrific. But Palestinians are telling me, we don't like what's going on because if we can't get the Israelis to do something, what's it matter all this posturing between the United, Washington and Jerusalem? And uh, if we get stuck where we can't be more, uh, uh, pro, we have to be as pro-Palestinian as the Americans, we're going to be limited and we're not making any progress. So I've been pretty hard on the Israeli leader in the last few minutes. The Palestinian leader, he had some great shakes either, frankly, because the Palestinian leader is a moderate. He is against violence. He's done some great things in terms of getting the Palestinian act together on the West Bank. But on negotiations, he did turn down and really refused to discuss the issues. The Omert, the last prime minister, who offered him a major deal. Not the perfect deal. He let it, he let it lie. The Palestinian position, we're not looking, is getting tougher. So if you're an American president, you want to be in the position where if you want to move on the peace process, probably both sides respect you, but they're a little nervous about you. You don't want to be in a position where one side's watching in awe and can't figure out quite what to do and knows that it wants to stay out of negotiations as a result, and the other side is, uh, thinks that you're against them. Bad, bad scene. And so right now, we have to figure out a way to avoid that uh, a situation. Now, I believe that the Israeli government made a major error because there was another, uh, there was another problem that the Israelis uh, have faced. On the one hand, the, this administration, and people don't generally realize it, has been better for Israel on the security level than, certainly than the Bush administration in its later years. Bush said all the right things. I was present in Jerusalem at the time, uh, in May, uh, the celebration of Israel's 60th anniversary in May 2008, George W. Bush in the room, of course there were thousands, but the point is, um, uh, and everybody heaping praise on George W. Bush for being such a great president for uh, Israel. George Bush didn't want conflicts with Israel. George Bush said a lot of nice things in private, even more than in public, from what I've been able to determine in my academic role, because I study these things, but, or at least I'm supposed to, but the point is, uh, when it came to the security angle out behind the scenes and the Israelis' concern about what the heirs were developing, Barack Obama, as I understand it, from Israelis, has given the Israelis what they want. The defense established were very pleased with Barack Obama and what he's done. So it's a very complicated situation that we confront today because at the same time that Barack Obama is confronting Bibi Netanyahu, he's providing the Israeli security they need. But we've also got another problem. European attitudes, 
change, uh, uh, public attitudes, campus attitudes, American campus attitudes, moving against Israel. And what I fear, in terms of Obama's success, is that for the Israelis, the Goldstone Report, the attitude of de delegitimization, the notion that many Israelis can't go into Britain because they'll be ar arrested, the particular attitude in Britain, not the European governments, but the European populace, not the American government, but the American campuses, not the American populace, of course. There is a sense it is doing to the Israeli psyche, this kind of anti-Israeli attitude, comparison with apartheid, South Africa, you all know the position. It's doing to the Israeli public what the suicide bombings, and I kid you not, did a decade ago to the Israel, or almost a decade ago, to the Israeli public. It's making them more nervous. A high-ranking Israeli, right of center, but somehow in the past sympathetic with Obama, had uh, told me in a conversation a couple of weeks ago, we're worried about delegitimization we are being demoralized and de-moralized. We are being seen as an unethical state, as an illegitimate state. And of course, I made my speech about how wonderful Israel, uh, Obama has been for Israeli security. And he said to me, yes, of course you're right, who cares? I said, who cares? Are you crazy? He said, it's the delegitimization de we worry about. It's the decline in the in the perspective, in the picture of the U.S.-Israeli relationship, even if the American president is friendly, we worry. So there are levels to this problem. And in the last couple of days with the president's speech, the president in 2010 has been all over the place. At times he said, oh, you know, the, Amer the Israelis and Palestinians are not ready, and if they're not ready, how can we be ready, et cetera, et cetera. But in his last speech, not only did he talk about, as we heard in the introduction, uh, uh, resolving the Arab-Israeli dispute as the vital national security interest of the United States, no problem there, but he echoed what General Petraeus has been saying this year. He echoed, echoed what Vice President Biden said in Jerusalem, even though Biden claimed he was misquoted, but you knew he wasn't misquoted because journalists aren't that stupid and because uh, uh, and because Petraeus had said it too, and clearly Biden had been present at briefings by the military. The argument that uh, the Arab-Israeli dispute is costing us significantly in terms of both blood and treasure. That's not good for Israel. That puts pressure on Israel. But I, and the reason I'm angry at Netanyahu is that he was warned. He should have known better. But he thinks he can confront the President of the United States. And we saw this today. We saw this today when uh, Ronald Lauder, the, head, uh, the President of the World Jewish Congress, asked in a letter in the New York Times, an ad, an adver advertisement, why does the thrust of this administration's Middle East rhetoric seem to blame Israel for the lack of movement on peace talks? And then Lauder said proudly, well, I checked with the Prime Minister and uh, 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 he, um, uh, I received his uh, green light, his support, before taking the ad. Actually, the ad apparently appeared in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, I apologize. So the point is, oh, Netanyahu shouldn't be doing that. He should have told Lauder, Lauder to stop and make sure that that leaked, that he's trying to stop this kind, this kind of tension. Well, where do we go from here? Uh, let me conclude with a long series of alternatives uh, that um, if I were talking in the White House at this moment, what I would suggest are the alternatives, where I think the administration is going, and where I think the administration should, going, should be going. Uh, we need a strategy because we've got a mess. We've got a real mess. Uh, and it's kind of symbolized for me by what happened at the dinner uh, that Netanyahu threw for Biden. Biden was 90 minutes late because the announcement, he didn't know what to do, he almost didn't go. And what the Israelis had prepared was a very nice, nice gesture, very nice gesture, a, um, uh, a kind of, um, they had planted a number of trees uh, in honor of uh, Biden's mother who had, had recently passed away. And they, um, 
and there was a sort of uh, plaque, I guess, a, a, uh, like a picture with uh, commemorating what they had done. And, and, uh, and Netanyahu making his speech, of course, very upset about the developments of the day, was leaning down like this. And as he leaned down, he did not realize that he was leaning on this lovely, apparently lovely um, commemorative plaque of glass. And so when he came, when he stood to give it to the vice president, he discovered to his horror that it was in pieces and uh, that he had, by leaning down, uh, he completely destroyed uh, the, uh, uh, the commemorative uh, uh, picture and set uh, and very fancy set that was being given to the uh, vice president. That's the symbol of where we are today. How do we get out of this? What do we do next? What do we do? What should we do? Let's talk. So first of all, uh, there are a, a variety of, of alternatives. Here's, wh here's what they are. Number one, to pursue the same Obama policy, let's try to get the proximity talks going. Well, that's why the ferment in Washington, because this is not working. The Palestinians see what's going on and they're sitting back and they don't want to go. And the Israelis, they're getting disillusioned too. How can the United States, if it can't handle the Israelis, handle the proximity talks? Obama looks bad, everybody looks bad, everybody agrees, we've got to do something more, we've got to do something different, let's do it. Secondly, uh, make a deal with Hamas. The Hamas has indicated it's ready for a hudna, a long time, uh, a, 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 a long time ceasefire. Uh, well, that won't work in part because Obama is against dealing with Hamas. Uh, and then again, what he never gets credit for is from the Israeli point of view, and actually the Palestinians don't want, the, the West Bank Palestinians, the uh, PA, they don't, plus the Palestinian Authority, they don't want him to deal with Hamas. So what does he gain by dealing with Hamas when you have a semi uh, a ceasefire in place right now? Uh, so that doesn't work. Go back to unilateralism. In the mid, middle of the last decade, the Israelis were big on unilateralism. Well, they withdrew from Lebanon, southern Lebanon. They withdrew from Gaza. It wasn't handled correctly. I think it could have been done better, but they withdrew. But nobody's going to go for unilateralism now when nobody trusts each other and the Israelis are not going to withdraw from the West Bank so close to their airport and population centers unilaterally. Not now. Uh, well, incrementalism. Is, the, my, uh, uh, is my fourth option, incrementalism. Do things, do things a little bit here, a little bit there. There's a lot, of, a lot of things brewing among the Israelis and Palestinians beneath the headlines. First of all, we've had General Dayton there under Bush and under Obama. He's training the Palestinian security forces. The Palestinians for the first time, for the first time, what they should have done in 1994 and 1995 and 1996, they're developing their businesses, their institutions. Uh, the 7% growth rate uh, in uh, the West Bank, believe it or not. Um, they're developing a, a, mil a real military. Abu Mazen gets a lot of credit. And Netanyahu has recognized them for doing that. Work with that. Try to promote this. I'll come return to it in a minute. But it's only incrementalism. Americans are impatient. They, Obama wants to do something now. That doesn't play in Washington, as I have learned to my um, uh, in my own experiences. All right, say many on the campuses worldwide, let's get a one-state solution. Uh, if Arabs and Jews together, well, forget a one-state solution. Forget a one-state solution. Uh, they, these, these two sides have to be separated, as the British discovered the British, in the mandate, as the UN discovered, as everybody's always discovered. It's a terrible idea, and one of the problems for Israel, because Israel loses with a one-state solution, because eventually there'll be more Arabs than, 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 than uh, Jews in the state, so it'll either be not democratic or not Jewish. And I say to Israelis, I'm always saying to Israelis, get going on this. Don't waste any time because the one-state solution will only grow. You're making a mistake. Well, something that's going on uh, in Washington, another idea is what I call reconfiguration. Reconfiguration. Get rid of Hamas. Let the PA take over. Get rid of Abu Mazen and get a stronger leader. Uh, who do you have in mind? Well, some people say Marwan Barghouti, who's been jailed by the Israelis. He's a, he's a character who, um, uh, who might be able to take over the Palestinians. A lot of people have doubts. He's a key figure. Unfortunately, he's recently been advocating violence, which makes him a little less appealing. But the point is, which is how he got into jail, but the point is, reconfigure the Palestinians and somehow 
convince Netanyahu to change his coalition and somehow get the leader of the opposition, Sipi Livni, who came in first but didn't have the votes in the Knesset to form a government, get them to unite with labor that's a dream government and make peace for God's sake. And that's an American dream. I'm sure Obama would be so happy to hear that this is what he could do. But as we know from the time we tried to elect Shimon Peres over Netanyahu in 1996, trying to manipulate another country's elections, especially when you've got as cockeyed and as poor a, a political system as the Israelis do, is you're asking for trouble. So forget that. And don't try to do it, I say to the Obama administration. Don't even think about it. Let the Israelis do it themselves. You can't reconfigure uh, 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 the Israeli political uh, uh, system. So. None of this is working, and, and as a result, there's a policy flavor of the month. It's growing. It's all over the place. Where, whoever you talk to, here's the topic that the Middle East experts are talking about right now. And that, of course, is an Obama plan or Obama principles or Obama statement. Everybody's got a different version. Some people say, we shouldn't be too detailed. We should make, have the president make a statement about where we're going. So everybody knows where we stand. Everybody knows where we stand, but we've got to codify it. And, you know, there's the uh, meeting uh, two weeks ago with the National Security Advisors. It wasn't quite what the press reports, as I understand it, from private sources, but the president came in for an hour. He came in for an hour. The president of the United States spent an hour listening to former National Security Advisors argue about whether or not there not should be an Obama plan. The fact that he was there suggests he's got some interest in it. <laughs> and it's a meeting with Middle East advisors last week. Everybody's talking about it. I'm in a study group. That's all we're talking about. Everybody's uh, 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 considering it. So why not? Why not let the president get up and tell everybody where we stand on the refugees. The Palestinians won't like it. Tell everybody where we stand in Jerusalem. The Israelis won't like it. Tell everybody where we stand on borders. Both sides won't like it. But we'll take a stance, we'll know, we'll guide the negotiations, and the negotiations will be about the Obama plan. And most people that I talk to, former officials, uh, future officials, experts, everybody's got their own version of an Obama plan. And if I had to predict, I would predict that we're going to have an Obama plan. I got to tell you, I think it's a mistake. I think it's a mistake because if you deliver a plan and both sides, and I think they will, both sides will say, that's nice, we're not interested. Where do you go next? The President of the United States has spoken. And if everybody says, that's nice, we're not interested, bye-bye, Barack, <laughs> then where do we go next? <laughs> what do we do next? I, I having an argument with a very prominent figure this morning about this. And he's very much, he's got his own version, but it's the same policy. I keep saying it's the same policy, friend. He's, no, no, mine is better. So um, he, uh, he says, well, even if the president messes it up, and he will, <laughs> it doesn't matter because then it'll, it'll, it'll focus the two sides. And I say if he's going to mess it up and the two sides will be unhappy, where's the focus? They'll be focusing on how they don't like it. So I'm going to lose on this one. I really predict I'm going to lose on this one, but it's a mistake, folks. So I can't say that I disagree with a policy unless I have an, a, an alternative, and I do have an alternative, which I think will work. And that is that you have to pursue the, you have to get off this idea of all the core issues being solved tomorrow. We're not going to get Jerusalem borders and refugees solved tomorrow. And you have to get off this idea that you have to go comprehensive. You have to have a strategy. You have to have a plan, not a public plan, a secret plan. Here's my plan. My plan is that there are a lot of, I return to the notion that lots of things going on in the West Bank that are good. The people aren't, there's no violence. Uh, 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 there's, um, uh, uh, there's this development of a real se serious security force on the Palestinian side. The economy is brewing. Let's do more. And I like, and a lot of Palestinians don't like him, but I like Prime Minister Fayyad. Every American loves Prime Minister Fayyad because he's the first, he's the Palestinian Prime Minister, he's the first leader who's a real leader who really wants to get things done and he wants to build a Palestinian state and he wants to do it, he thinks he could have a state in 2011 that's ready and they can unilaterally declare it. 
Israelis hate this idea, but why? why? Because if you've got a Palestinian state, then you've got something to work with. If you've got responsible officials, then you're so much better off than the 1990s. So just when everybody is disillusioned, I have a little saying. When things look good in the Middle East, they're never as good as they look. And when things look bad in the Middle East, they're never as bad as they look. So they're not as bad as they look. This is good. This is important. Why not the Fayyad plan? All right, you don't like the Fayyad plan? Let me give you a couple of Israeli plans. Now, there's Shaul Mafaz, the number two in Kadima, hawkish, former defense minister. He wants to recognize the Palestinian state immediately. And uh, he wants to uh, th uh, then have negotiations. And I'm, I'm, you know, it's a very sophisticated plan, and, and I don't have time to go into it in great detail. But he wants to get a Palestinian state in place and then discuss the final issues with a Palestinian state in place. It's a shocking proposal because this guy's a righty. But he says, let's just give it to the Palestinians, and then we'll have something to talk about. Then there's Ehud Yari, who's Israel's, uh, he's a big media star. He's their Ara the Israeli Arabist on television. Uh, and you know, you all know what big stars are like in, uh, in the media. And he, who not, who's not such a left winger, he wants, to, he has a new idea. And his idea is, he says, look, in 1949, when the Israelis and Palestinians, uh, when the Israelis and Arabs had their armistice agreements after the 1949 war, uh, which the War of Liberation for Israel, the Nakba, the catastrophe for the Palestinians, uh, the result was that Israel had an armistice with the Arab states that were fighting with it, the key states on its border, but there were no Palestinians in power to make a deal with. Now there are uh, Palestinians. Let's have an armistice agreement. Let's create, there's some territories Israel can give back. Let's have a provisional state that's a really functioning state, and then negotiate, make a guarantee, negotiate the final uh, uh, issues. It, he's, he says, Mofaz says, everybody, uh, lots of people say, particularly in Israel, Palestinians too, at the moment the leadership is too weak or stupid, and the, um, uh, I'm talking about on the Israeli Palestinian side, sorry folks, and the, um, uh, and Obama is too new to get a comprehensive agreement. In 2010, we're not going to solve Jerusalem, we're not going to solve refugees, and we're not going to solve the borders. But we can have a Palestinian state if we just negotiate in a different way. Someone said to me before uh, uh, we t started tonight, tell us, you know, why they always talk and nothing happens. So these people say we can have something happen. Use the proximity talks to get something in place. We can make it work. We can do it. And now, I'm convinced. I think that's where we should go. Obama can always give a plan. This is the wrong time for a plan. You can have bridging proposals. Obama can make a plan if the talks break down. It's a more legitimate time to have a plan from the President of the United States. Let's have a policy of getting back into some kinds of talks, secret, public, proximity, I, th I do blame the Palestinians for not going to direct talks. I think they made a terrible mistake, and I blame them. I've been harsh on Nita uh, and Netanyahu tonight, and let me say the Palestinians also have made a number of mistakes. We've let them get away with it, and it's wrong. But we've got to move somewhere. The mistake that Washington is, could make, I think is about to make, is to go for broke. I, I don't know if any football fans here. But you know, it's the fourth quarter, you got eight or nine minutes, you've got the ball, you're three points behind, and you spend three downs uh, on 70, uh, trying for Hail Mary 70 yard passes. And Obama plan is a Hail Mary approach. It won't work. Let's do something better. Let's do something more, more productive. And then, then I can answer the question of the evening, can Obama bring peace in the Middle East? If he chooses the right approach, the right strategy, yes, he can. If not, no, he can't. Thank you very much.